and that helps us get to know one another by name. Um, we're glad for those of you who braved the cold this morning, and we uh, are glad for those who'll be worshiping uh, with Facebook by Facebook today. And um, again, I want to applaud you for, um, for supporting Ben Acton uh, as he does this sabbatical time of three months. He'll be returning in February and then go back on sabbatical again after Easter, I believe. Uh, but he organized everything beautifully. And I want to thank you for your very gracious welcome to me and to Edward back there. Uh, you've been very kind and welcoming to us. There is, as I mentioned last week, a salmon colored sheet with all the information about who to contact in case of a concern or a need. They are in the narthex, I believe, so you can get one as you leave. And um, been asked to announce that the Presbyterian Women Coordinating Team that, was meet, that is meeting today after worship will meet downstairs in the fellowship hall uh, where you'll have your meal. So remind you of that change. And um, call your attention to the announcement page, um, the many announcements there. And now Lisa Jackson has an announcement she would like to share. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, it's time to start thinking about Family Promise again. Our year to host our families is, uh, our week is April 7th. It is not Holy Week like it has been in the past, but we are going to do Easter baskets again. So the supplies for the Easter baskets will be due March 24th. And as you came in, you may have seen some of our donation boxes. There are wish lists on here. I also can email you a wish list, and that would have a link that goes directly to their Amazon wish list. So if there's things on here that maybe you're not as familiar with, like uh, bed bug covers or things like that, you can go to their Amazon wish list and see exactly what they need. Um, the wish list is optional, but we do want to make sure we have enough supplies for the Easter baskets. So right now we're focusing on that, and those will be due by March 24th so that the families will have enough time to assemble them in time for their children for Easter. When you bring your supplies in, there are two donation boxes. One is down in the breezeway, and the other is in the room across from the office. So just bring your supplies in and put them in one of those donation boxes. And you can also find these slips of, with the wish list on it in those boxes or out in the narthex. And if you want me to email you the link, just let me know, and I will send you an electronic copy. Thank you. These are our announcements today. Let us worship God. Let us read our printed call to worship responsively. The one who calls you together longs for each of us to hear and be blessed. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Blessed is the one who comes bringing trustworthy words for the healing of the world. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Please stand as you are able to sing our opening hymn, number 450, Be Thou My Vision.
You may be seated. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But our God is a loving, forgiving God, and when we go to God asking for forgiveness, we receive that. So confident of God's love and wishes for us to be more faithful disciples, let us confess our sins as we read together our printed prayer of confession, followed by a moment of silent confession. Let us pray together. Holy God, you see into each one of us and know us fully as creatures in need of your constant care. We confess that we have neither heard your word nor followed your will. We have failed our nation, neighbors, families, friends, and ourselves. Give us ears to hear your wisdom and send people who show your love to us. Lead us to honesty and faith that we may begin again with renewed strength as we pray these and our silent confessions. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Friends, who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ, and Christ died for us, Christ rose for us, Christ reigns in power for us, Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation, the old life is gone, a new life has begun. Hear and believe the good news, in Jesus Christ we are forgiven, thanks be to God. And now, as God's forgiven people, let us extend the words of peace to one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Please be seated. Karen. <laughs> Good morning. I'm going to have Miss Cheryl come up and hold my hand. So I have to be up here by myself. <laughs> oh, yeah. And see, look. If you're good, you are good. <laughs> there you go. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> Thank you for coming up here. <laughs> um, okay, so this morning, I'm going to let. I'm gonna, I need my hand for just a minute. <laughs> I just I take Sherry's direction. Uh, yeah, she she literally hold my hand. <laughs> okay, so this morning um, we're going to be talking about a guy named Samuel. Have you ever heard of him? I know we talked a little bit about, in Sunday school about him, and then you and I talked about him this morning because we were trying to guess how old he was. So let me tell you a real quick background story about Samuel. Um, Samuel's mother was Hannah, and Hannah really wanted to have a baby. 
And so she prayed and prayed and prayed, and she told God, look, if, if you'll give me a baby, um, I will dedicate that child to the Lord. And so she had a baby. She had a little boy named Samuel. And when he was old enough, she did, in fact, um, dedicate him to the Lord. And she took him to the temple, and she told Eli, who was the priest, that, um, here you go. He's here to serve the Lord. And so he was there, and Eli... Eli's an old man, but he takes him in, and, and Eli's got, some own, got his own issues going on. But anyway, um, he um, brings Samuel, and Samuel grows up a little bit. And so one night, they're getting ready for bed. Eli's in his room, and Samuel's in his room. And uh, so Samuel's laying there, and all of a sudden, he hears somebody call his name. Samuel. So he's like, whoa, wonder what Eli wants. So he gets up and he goes to Eli's room and Eli's like, I didn't call you, um, go back to bed. So Samuel goes back to bed and he lays down and he's there for a minute and um, Samuel hears somebody calling his name. Samuel. <laughs> so Samuel's like, what is that? <laughs> So he goes to Eli, and Eli's like, I'm not calling you. Go back to bed. So he lays back down, and of course, he hears somebody calling his name. Samuel. <laughs> so he goes, goes to Eli, and by this time, Eli's thinking, uh, wait a minute, I know what's going on here. What do you think's going on, Miss Cheryl? Mm -hmm. He thinks God might be calling him. That's exactly right. Eli says, um, I think God's probably going to talk to you. So next time you go back, say, here I am, Lord. I'm your servant. What do you want me to do? So he goes back, and he lays down. And sure enough, he hears somebody calling him. Samuel. And he says, here I am, Lord. What can I do for you? And so God has Samuel do a lot of stuff. Now, at this point, we've decided, Cheryl and I, that he's about 12 years old, so he's very young when he's called uh, initially, but he does a lot of stuff. Um, he'll actually call, end up calling the first two kings of Israel, Saul and King David, um, but he listens. He's listening for God. Now, we are still called by God. Cheryl. <laughs> I thought so, but you. <laughs> Or it could be me. Karen. Yes, Karen, that's right. Now, we're not called in such dramatic fashion necessarily. We may not hear God talking to us like that. But he does talk to us. How does he talk to us? Maybe in our hearts and in our minds. Um, and um, it may not be, uh, hey, Miss Cheryl, uh, teach Sunday school. Mm. Yeah, I know, that's scary, right? <laughs> it, but in our hearts, we may know God's calling me to do something. Lead children's sermon. Uh, teach Sunday school, um, help the homeless on Saturdays. Sing in the choir. Sing in the choir, yes. So, what was the other one? Please sing in the choir. Okay. Yes, please sing in the choir. For that, you might get a, you know, a song. Yeah, you can get a lollipop. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so as you go out through the week, um, listen for God. Listen for him to call us. And he may be calling the church. First Presbyterian Church of Garner. That's right. <laughs> he may be calling us to do something. So as you go out this week, really listen for God's voice. Um, like I said, it won't, be, it won't necessarily be anything as dramatic as Samuel had, um, but it will certainly uh, can be on our hearts and our minds what he wants us to do. All right, so let's say a short prayer. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we are thankful that uh, you are always looking, for, looking out for us and always uh, searching um, our hearts, uh, what you want us to do, what we're being called to do. Help us to hear your voice uh, when, you, um, when you call us and uh, what, we, what you are leading us to do. Um, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.
Please join me in prayer. By your Holy Spirit, O God, open our ears, our eyes, and our minds to the Holy Word so that it comes to rule within us for Jesus' sake. Amen. Our first reading is from the Gospel of John. After John the Baptist identifies Jesus as the Son of God, Jesus calls Andrew and Simon Peter as the first disciples. Listen what, to what happens the following day as Jesus calls Philip. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel, Jesus answered. Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, very truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angel of God ascending and descending upon the son of man. Well, Karen already preached our sermon today, but I'm going to give it a shot, and we'll dig a little bit deeper today in our, in our Old Testament reading and our story about, about Samuel. Let us, uh, let us pray. We thank you, O oh Lord, for our Bible, for those whom you inspired to write, for those you empowered to translate and preserve. We thank you for the way this ancient book is forever new, and has a way of speaking to us down through the centuries. Help us recognize your word to us today. Amen. Last Sunday's focus was on God's call to us. We heard the story of Jesus calling the fishermen to follow him, and then we heard the story of Jonah, who was very reluctant to do as the Lord commanded. You may remember that Jonah did everything he could to avoid preaching to the people of Nineveh. Today we look again at God's call, but with the help and support of others as we discern how God is calling us. We just heard Jean read in our first, uh, in our gospel reading, that Jesus called another disciple, Philip. And Philip, in turn, encourages Nathaniel to step out of his preconceived ideas about the identity of the Messiah. Philip invites Nathaniel to come and see. But Nathaniel hesitates to accept Jesus as the Messiah because of his doubt that anything, anyone so extraordinary could come out of a lowly place like Nazareth. Now we turn to our Old Testament story of another call. This story, a call, goes back centuries, about 11 before Jesus. It's the story of Samuel, who as a young boy is called by God. And when he grew up, he became a judge, known for his wise decisions. He was the first in a long line of prophets, and as Karen said, he anointed both King David and King Saul. Now, in earlier chapters, we read about Samuel's mother, Hannah, who was barren. And she prayed ardently to God, praying for a child, promising that she would dedicate her son or daughter to God. God heard her prayer. And she bore a, a boy named Samuel, meaning God heard. She remembered her promise to dedicate her child to God, and so she took him to the temple and gave him or 
uh, to Eli to be his apprentice in the temple. And he was tasked with caring for the lamps in the temple. So listen again to what happened in Samuel, beginning at chapter 3, verse 1. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel, and he said, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But Eli said, I did not call. Lie down again. So Samuel went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But Eli said, I did not call. My son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time, and he got up, and he went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down. And if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. Then the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make both ears of anyone who hears it tingle. On that day, I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew, because his sons were blaspheming God, and he did not restrain them. Therefore, I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be expiated by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay there until morning, and then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. He said, Here I am. Eli said, What was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me of all that he has told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And then he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. With all the technology available to us now, we don't have to miss anything. But sometimes we do, don't we? There are times when we miss God's call to us. Whether or not we realize it, God calls, sometimes loudly, or sometimes barely a whisper, sometimes there is just a tingle, as the scripture suggests. Maybe God calls us right in the midst of our daily routine or right there in our dreams as we sleep. Now these days, there are so many other calls, so many loud and clamoring voices and noises around us demanding our attention all the time. How can we hear and discern that God is calling to us? But God does call. The scriptures remind us that God created us and has plans for each one of us. One of my favorite psalms is Psalm 139. The Lord, you have searched me and known me. You discern my thoughts from far away. 
It was you who formed me. You knit me together in my mother's womb. When I was being made, your eyes held my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me. These verses from Psalm 139 and from Samuel remind us that we are gods and there is nowhere we can flee from God or God's call to us. But we may not hear God calling us or we may not recognize God's voice as Samuel did not. And we may even ignore God calling us. Or we may assume that those things don't happen anymore, or certainly not to us, for what do we have to offer? Why would God call us? That's what the people back in Samuel's day thought as well. They didn't think that things like that, God calling in a dream, would happen anymore. Remember how the passage began, said the word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. There were no more burning bushes, no more parting of the seas, no more manna from heaven. It seemed like the age of miracles had passed. Even then and even now, we can't help but wonder, are we left on our own? The gospel story began, the word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. But then we read, the lamp of God had not gone out. Signs and visions, though rare, still happen. Even while Samuel sleeps, God does not sleep. And one night he heard his name called and he answered, Hello, I am here. What do you want? Thinking that Eli called him, he raced into Eli's room, but the old priest had not called out. The old priest was asleep when the boy burst into his room and disturbed him, thinking that it was Eli who had called him in the middle of the night. Then it happened again. The voice called out, Samuel, Samuel. And Eli thought, what in the world is this boy hearing? Why is he acting like this? Did he eat something last night that didn't agree with him? If that happened today, we might wonder if the chili cheese enchilada we had was acting up. But Eli went back to sleep, and then it happened again. And Eli started thinking, hmm, let's see. What if it was some kind of divine call? So, okay, Samuel, if it happens again, you need to answer. And the description of Samuel's call is part of a much larger story. The priestly house of Eli, with its greedy and corrupt sons, is about to fall. And in time, God will choose a new priest who will be Samuel to be consecrated in his place. The voice announced a new thing will take place, causing both ears of anyone who hears it will tingle. For God was acting still, and God will bring about a new thing through a very young boy. But the boy needs Eli's guidance. Samuel depends on Eli to instruct him on what to do. Eli's role of mentor and facilitator of God's call is crucial in this story. Instead of dismissing dismissing Samuel's experience, Eli comes to encourage him and instruct Samuel to listen. He even tells him how to respond. Eli tells Samuel, if he calls you again, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And Eli realizes that God truly called the boy to an amazing future. So he encouraged Samuel, despite the cost to his own family. 
Eli's sons are from the priestly line, and they had a birthright to serve in the temple, but they abused their power. And we need to remember that God does not always choose expected leaders. All we need to do is look at the fishermen that Jesus called, the laborers that became Jesus' disciples, for all people are given tasks in God's kingdom. This is an important story. God called Samuel, and God acts still today. Parents, grandparents, friends, and church members have a crucial role in encouraging others to listen and respond to God's call. With the demands of the world all around us pressing in on us all the time, we wonder if God can be present For it seems as though visions are rare and miracles today rarely happen. But we need each other to hear God calling. Through all the clamor around us, when the conversations about God in the public square are dominated by the extremes who talk the loudest, by those who define faith by particular issues, their issues, by those who understand religious experience in one way, their way. We are to help each other respond when God calls. That's why we have always stressed nurturing our children in the faith. We want our children and our grandchildren to know God. We want our children to have a faith on which they can rely in these challenging times. Nurturing one another in our own family. Nurturing one another here at church is up to us, each one of us. If someone had not taken an interest in you and me, if someone had not taught us the stories of faith or showed us how to live the Christian faith each day, it's likely we would not be here in the sanctuary. Who did those things for you? Was it your parents or your grandparents? Or Sunday school teachers or pastors or youth leaders? Was it the woman who sat next to your family in the pew each Sunday and took a real interest in you? Or was it the older gentleman who greeted you by name when you walked into the church every Sunday? Remember the people in your life who taught you what it means to be a child of God. Remember those people who showed you how to live faithfully despite the sorrows and challenges of life. Years ago, I heard a sermon preached, one I'll never forget, preached by George Worth, who was then pastor at First Presbyterian Church in Atlanta. And in his sermon he described his first grade Sunday school teacher, Miss Garropy. He described how she loved children, and they loved her. She taught the children the great Bible stories of Abraham and Sarah, Esther and Ruth, David. And when she talked about Jesus, he became the children's friend as well. George recalled Miss Garropy as patient and kind, And when he was with her, he felt God's presence too. Nevertheless, George was a PK, that is a preacher's kid, with a reputation for being rambunctious, to use a good old fashioned word. George's father was called to serve a different church and his family had to move away and George lost touch with his favorite teacher, Miss Garropy. But years later, just when George was preparing to be ordained to word and sacrament, he received a letter written in a feeble hand. It was from his first grade Sunday school teacher, Miss Garropy. She wrote, Dear George, it's been a long time since we talked together, but I have not forgotten you. In fact, I've been praying for you all these years, asking that the Lord would lead you into some kind of Christian work. When I found out you were going to be a minister, I knew my prayers finally had been answered. Congratulations, and God bless you. 
All my love, Miss Garropy. No words could describe George's feelings upon receiving this letter. And he doubts he will never fully realize the impact this gentle soul had on his life as a Christian. But he was sure that, in part, he is who he is as a man because of this little old lady who taught him about Jesus when he was a child and who prayed for him as he grew into adulthood. Now, you and I are here because someone, somewhere, sometime, taught us about Jesus, prayed for us, and provided a foundation in faith that helped shape who we are today and what we believe and how we live our lives. We may, may not remember their names today, but we cannot forget what they taught us. And wherever they are now, they are still very special to us, and we'll always be grateful to them. In George's sermon, he cited the Christian author and speaker, Joyce Landorf, who called these influential people in our lives, balcony people. In her book, by the same title, she wrote, Think of it, all around that sphere of clear air in our conscious minds runs a balcony filled with people who are not merely sitting there but are practically hanging over the rails, cheering us on. My mother, Joyce, wrote, already in heaven's balcony, she is there. She always told me I was special, that God gave me a unique ministry Today, I can almost see her leaning over the balcony rail, smiling down and saying to me, Joyce, I told you so. Ah, that great cloud of witnesses in our balcony, past and present. Where and what will we be without them? So think about the balcony people in your life for they have everything to do with who and what and where we are today. They are the movers and shakers in our lives, past and present. They help shape us into the people we have become. They are with us wherever we go and in whatever we do. Now, I know the church is planning on adding a lift evader, which will aid us physically getting upstairs, but that's not necessary as balcony people. We can become that for each other, cheering us on from today or from the balcony of heaven and earth, affirming us and encouraging us every step of the way. So who are your balcony people? Maybe today you can think about that and remember and give thanks for them in your life. Now, unlike Ms. Garropy, or the person who cheered you on in your life, there are other people that Landorf called basement people. Basement people have been negative toward us, more prone to criticize than to affirm. Those basement people doubt our abilities and hold us back from the potential with which God filled us on the day we were born. And we need balcony people, not basement people. Our children and our grandchildren and the children of this church and beyond need them now more than ever. You and I need them, those balcony people too, more than ever. So as we close, think about your children and grandchildren, your neighbors and those sitting around you here. For no matter our age or the circumstances of our lives, God is still calling each one of us. So what are you going to do to make the world a better place? How can we spread the love of Jesus Christ? There is always something we can do, both here in the congregation and beyond these doors. How will you use the gifts and the experiences that God has given to you to serve others? It's never too late to hear God's voice calling you. 
May God give us all the desire and the patience, the grace and perseverance, ability and heart to teach and live as balcony people for each other. May it be so. Let us pray. God of grace, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us that we may be more faithful teachers and mentors in your church. Open our hearts to the leading of your Holy Spirit. Anoint our lips to speak and teach with power. And in everything, give us the mind of Christ who taught in deed as well as in word. Fill us with joy in our discipleship and give us a sure sense of your abiding presence in our ministry together. Amen. And now let us sing our next hymn, number 60, 69, Here I Am, Lord.
Please be seated. Today, as our affirmation of faith, we'll be reading from the Book of Order about the great ends of the church. These great ends are our call to follow Jesus Christ. This is the work and the task that we have. So let us say together uh, what we are called to do. The great ends of the church are the proclamation of the gospel for the salvation of humankind, the shelter, nurture, and spiritual fellowship of the children of God, the maintenance of divine worship, the preservation of the truth, the promotion of social righteousness, and the exhibition of the kingdom of heaven to the world. And one of those ways we exhibit the kingdom of heaven, one of the ways you do, is through the prayer shawl. So Martha will come forward and lead us with the blessing of the prayer shawls. Thank you, Lynn. As you can see, we have several shawls and crosses to give today, so may we bow in prayer. Most gracious and merciful God, may your grace be upon these shawls, warming, comforting, enfolding, and embracing. May these mantles be a safe haven, a sacred place of security and well-being, sustaining and embracing in good times as well as difficult ones. May the ones who receive the shawls be cradled in hope, kept in joy, graced with peace, and wrapped in love. And Father, may this cross be a sign of your abiding strength and comfort for the one who receives it, serving as a reminder of your love and our church's prayers which surround us in every moment of distress and joy. For we make our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, who bore the cross and rose again to give us new life. Amen. Our first shawl today goes to Barbara Turpin. Uh, she has had some significant health issues. She's doing well. I talked with her uh, last week, and she really appreciates all the prayers and supports that the church has given her through this time of hers. Um, another shawl is going to Wanda Vandervoord. Uh, Wanda fell, and she had some you know, pain and soreness from that. But also, her husband, Will, is um, in hospice care, and as of Friday, he was transitioning, so we need to keep them both in our prayers for love and support during this time. We have another prayer shawl that was given. I gave it uh, two weeks ago privately to Carrie Dixon Cash for her son Philip's mother-in-law, Kathy Ward. Kathy has very difficult time with diabetes, and as of Thanksgiving, she was in a coma but through prayer and medical treatment, she has come out of the coma. She is in rehab now. And so we really need to pray for continued strength and blessings for her. But uh, Carrie was going to Charleston to meet Philip, so she took the shawl with her so Kathy could have it. Another shawl goes to Mark Morgan, who is our administrative assistant, Stephanie Taylor Morgan's husband, because he lost his mother last week. Another shawl goes to Mark's father, Fred, because he lost his wife. Another shawl goes to Stephanie Taylor Morgan because she lost her grandfather. So this year has put a real whammy on the Morgan family, so let's keep them in our prayers. And another shawl goes to Michael DeGeronimo, who is a friend of Sandy Lee, who was fighting cancer. And so we pray that his treatment and his protocol will help through there. We have two prayer crosses. One cross goes to Abe Snap, who was a young man who has had an immune disorder. And I talked with his mother, Megan, last week, and they need to go to Duke for regular treatments. So please keep them in your hearts and in your prayers. And then another shot, I mean, another cross goes to Gloria Oakey for the loss of her mother. And so God speaks to us through all of these gifts and through the gifts of making these. And I can't thank Rich Whipple enough for making the crosses. And I can't thank enough Lucy Paradise, Kathy Blue, and Roxanne Porter for making these shawls. And the shawl um, inventory is very low. And if anyone would like to learn how to answer the call to knit or crochet, 
call me and I can help you with that. But a special shout out to Roxanne Porter because I had the shawls to give and had need for another one that were in the colors be suitable for a man. And so I asked Roxanne, I said, I hate to put you on the spot, but can I have one by the 21st? She had it done. And so we thank her for her diligence. And I thank all of you for your prayers and supports of this ministry. How many here have participated in this wonderful ministry? Are there those of you who? Yeah. 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 We'd love for you to stand. Sure. Be recognized. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Yeah. As we go to our time of morning prayer, uh, please remember the lengthy list on your bulletin of the prayer concerns of church members and families and friends. So many names are listed there. And remember those as you, uh, bring your, you, know, as you pray this week. And um, Martha shared a few that I was going to mention as well. Gloria Olkey and the death of her mother, and uh, Stephanie Taylor and the death of her grandfather. And also wanted to, again, bring your attention to Will Brothers under hospice care in his final days, and to Wanda, who is caring very faithfully for him. Now, trusting in the power of God who promises to hear all our prayers, let us turn to God in our morning prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, we give thanks for what you have done for us. We give thanks for the amazing stories we read in Scripture, stories of your love which never lets us go, even when we are not faithful, stories of how you came to us, and even though we rejected you, you died for us, taking all our sins upon yourself. Stories of invitation and call to follow where you lead, serving in your name. We know, too, that you have promised to hear our prayers and that you call us to pray for one another, both for those we know and for those whose faces and stories and needs are known only to you. Hear us as we bring the spoken and silent concerns of our families, our church, our community, and our world. We pray for your holy church that it be a living sign of the kingdom that cannot be shaken. Make us humble in our service and generous with our invitations to stranger and outcast. Guide us as we follow your commands to love you and as we devote ourselves to the healing and liberation of your children everywhere, that all all may have the gift of fullness of life and peace in you. We pray for our world in distress. Be a rock of refuge and strong fortress for those in trouble, especially in places of great conflict and suffering. Especially we remember those living through bombs and gunfire in Gaza and Israel and Ukraine. We pray for so many in our country and beyond who are battling the bitter cold weather and for those who are without a hot meal or without a warm and safe home. Move among our world leaders and nations to forego places of power and privilege to address the needs of those who have little, those who are struggling to survive all over the world. And we pray for those in our church and beyond in our community who are burdened by suffering. We lift up to your care those who are sick in body, mind, and spirit, those facing medical procedures and treatments, those who are weary, lonely, and grieving. We pray too for those coming to the end of their days on earth. Receive them into your loving care welcoming them into the company of saints. And be with those who watch and wait with them. Now, gracious God, send us forth to witness to what we have heard and seen and believe. Empower us to live in ways that others will come to know you as we pray together in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray and not just say, 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, we enjoy blessings far more than we can name, far more than we can know. And now let us share some of those blessings, a portion of those blessings with others for the support and the building up of our church as we bring our offering today. pray. Accept these gifts we bring today and the dedication of our lives. Enrich the ministries of your people that the work of our church be made strong for the sake of the needy world. Make us grateful to be able to share what you have given first to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Now our closing hymn is God of Grace and Glory, 307.
And now, brothers and sisters, as you go out into the week ahead, go out and listen for God calling you by name, and go out encouraging one another to answer God's call. Whatever you do in word or in deed, do everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God through him. The grace, mercy, and peace of the triune God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer, be upon you and all those you love and all those whom no one loves this day forth and forevermore. Amen.